Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm I'm hanging in there. It's been a hard week with lots of good things in it too. So my son flew back from Montana and I helped him surprise the rest of the family and that was super fun. Um, my other son won his first basketball game, uh, sorry, uh, playoff basketball game, then lost the next one. And so now they're out of the playoffs, but that one win was exciting. My daughter is settling into a new school and doing very, very well. So like so many good things amidst like just an overwhelming schedule and lots of demands. So yeah. How are you? I'm doing okay. Uh, on a far more pedestrian note than any of those kind of things, I guess I'm uh, fairly disappointed today. So some things in life are just profoundly nostalgic. And recently, Hulu added to their repertoire uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And yes, that's awesome. I went back and watched probably half of the first episode, and I was deeply disappointed. I thought it was going to be amazing, and I was not thrilled. Well, in my experience, like I don't have a ton of experience with TV, so this is an uninformed statement. But I think, like, aren't isn't the first episode usually like a pilot episode, and it's kind of a little rough anyway? Yeah, it definitely could be that. It definitely could be that. I, I am hopeful that I will really enjoy future episodes at whatever point I give it a shot. But I just. Yeah, I just was hoping for a lot, and especially with the there's a remake that has been done recently that turns it into like a gritty drama of some kind, and it made mm. me realize how much that was not what I wanted. Um, yeah, I'm like how how did we go from Fresh Prince with Will Smith to a gritty drama? But anyway, anyway, <laughs> so that's what's on my mind. <laughs> well, okay, all right. So I do have to ask though. Do you still know all the words to the intro song? I probably could get through 75% of it. Oh, I'm not going man. to, but I could probably get 75%. Oh, talk about a letdown. Okay. Are you at 100% right. on this one? I am on 100 It's like one of the only pop culture references I can actually like perform well on. So, uh, oh, well. Oh, well. So... I'm assuming you didn't call because you were thinking about Fresh Prince. What have you been thinking about? <laughs> no, that was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't even actually know the, the Hulu thing, with, so that's cool. Um, so we are in the season of Lent as we record today, and our church is participating in a weekly fast in addition to other Lenten practices in terms of communal scripture readings that we're doing, uh, you know, on our own, but as a participation within the broader body, uh, some liturgical things that they're doing in community groups and lots of great stuff. But it's the fasting that has my attention, right? It's a very Lenten thing to do. Uh, many people give up something for Lent. Many people fast in various ways during Lent because it's a season of reflecting on our own sinfulness our own humanity, our own lack, and our desperate need for God. And all of these 40 days leading up to Easter is a great time to reflect on that and then celebrate uh, what Christ accomplished on the cross. So I am right in the middle of it, and I imagine to some extent you are too. So I'm curious, though, I don't have a good theology of fasting. I don't actually practice fasting very frequently. I mean, a handful of times over my adult life that I have fasted for various reasons. And I'm wondering, like, does that make me a bad Christian? Like, or like, what is the role of fasting and how does it fit together? And I'm hoping you can help me. You know, this is such an interesting question. I think that the practice of fasting is fairly foreign to many Christians today. 
And behind that, a theology of fasting is even more foreign. So if I look at my experience, the church I'm in now, uh, like the church I was in before this one, both would at least once a year declare some kind of corporate fast. Both churches also encourage private fasting in some way, shape, or form. So I, I have done some kind of fasting uh, on a f- somewhat regular, at least annual basis for the last several years of my life. But I don't know that I have ever dug into Scripture. Divin into Scripture? I don't know that I have ever divin into Scripture to actually see what fasting is all about. And anytime I've heard someone teach or preach on fasting, to be honest, a large chunk of it is how-to manual-ish. Let's show (laughs) you how you ought to fast, which is not bad. Helping us practice a habit well is a good thing to do in a sermon. But you use the phrase, a theology of fasting. I don't know that I have one. And I'm very interested to sort of just flip through the Bible texts and try to let a theology of fasting emerge. Uh, That is, I would love to build one because I'm like you, when I have heard fasting preached on, I think there's been... This is this speaks to me. I feel like I have this general statement a lot on the podcast, and I'm realizing that this is just a part of my makeup. So one of the takeaways I've gotten from those fa- uh, from those sermons that probably was not intended, given the frequency with which I've experienced it, but this sense of you ought to fast mm. uh, that that I am not fasting enough, or I'm not like it's not a built-in spiritual practice. So I feel some level of guilt or some level of, actually, this is kind of weird. Maybe it's not guilt or shame. Maybe it's like, I'm embarrassed because I don't really know what's going on here. And I feel like everybody else has got this one figured out. So maybe it's like, I want to keep this to myself. Like, oh, I don't really understand what fasting is all about. And And even when I do fast, I'm like, I don't quite know what I'm doing right now. So there's that aspect to it. But then, like you said, with the sermons, I feel like I've heard just like how to, and we're going to, this is how we're going to fast as a body or whatever, and kind of explaining that, which is all well and good. But it leaves me feeling like I still don't know what we're doing here. Like I get we're doing all of this together in this moment for this reason, but on a bigger picture, I don't know what fasting is all about. And then it's not all that helpful. That sounds horrible. It's not helpful to look in the Bible. But I guess when I looked in the Bible in preparation for talking about this, I didn't get a lot of help. I didn't get a lot of, like, there's no verse I can turn to that says, this is a theology of fasting, and this is why we do it, and this is why God instituted it, right? It's not there. Mm-hmm. No, I think this is really interesting. So, knowing we were going to have this conversation, I also went and pulled up a list of verses about fasting. And I'll tell you my my starting point about fasting. My sort of starting point about fasting is Jesus teaching in the Gospels. I default to the Mark 2 version of this story, but I think he says this several different places, where Jesus basically says, you know how you used to fast? Well, now you're going to fast differently which is a very unhelpful comment on a lot of levels because he doesn't clarify how they used to fast, nor does he necessarily clarify a lot about how they're supposed to fast now, but it at least gives me a starting point. So my default is to say uh, in a question like this, then if that's what Jesus has to say about fasting, let's start with what does the Old Testament say about fasting And maybe that can cue us in on what Jesus means when he says it's going to be different. That's funny because I start with Jesus as well and want to work backward to the Old Testament to make sure I understand what he was referring to. But I do so from a different text. 
um, I think of two texts, actually. One where Jesus says, you know, people are like accusing him. How come you and your disciples aren't fasting? And he said, well, how can people fast while the bridegroom is here? There, there'll come a day when the bridegroom's not here and then they'll fast. But right now, like you don't fast. And uh, okay, it still doesn't tell me what I'm, why I fast when the bridegroom's not there. Like I still don't understand. But then there's another teaching of Jesus where he said, when you fast, you know, don't make it so obvious to everybody that you're fasting. Instead, like put oil on your, you know, take a shower, put on regular clothes. Don't let anybody know that you're fasting. So I think I start with those and I go, okay, well, there's some assumption that we will fast. Where does that assumption come from? And that's when I start working back to the Old Testament. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll be honest, I did in looking at the Old Testament, I don't know if anything specifically struck you, but there are a number of things that I thought were very, very interesting. First of all, I could not find any reference to fasting in the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the founding document of Israel. This is what it's all based on. I am not aware of any reference to fasting in that. Were, are you? Did you happen to come across anything like that? I have. I did not, but you might hear the pages flipping. I'm flipping through my Hebrew lexicon to see if it references any passages with the word fasting in it that are from the uh, from the uh, Pentateuch. Well, so while you're flipping, let me tell you what the big picture of what it looked like to me. And then you can look through the lexicon and tell me if this seems accurate-ish. It seems to me we get three general categories of comments about fasting in the Old Testament. The largest chunk of them are from the prophets. And the prophets make some comments about how Israel ought to fast and why they ought to fast. So that makes sense. Then yeah. there are a handful of references from the Psalms about fasting. And if the prophets give us a good external view on what fasting is supposed to be about kind of in a social context, the Psalms give us the private individual perspective on what an experience of fasting was like. And then we have some narrative stories that involve fasting. But what's interesting to me is those stories are all from Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Right. Which means... Very, very late in Israel's history. Yes. There is nothing from the Pentateuch. There is nothing from the era of the kings. There's nothing, like, really, on some level... All we've got is those three categories. Here's what the prophets say about a thing that we're never told was actually happening. And then here's what the Psalms say about that same thing we never hear any stories about. And then here's some late stories about it. That in and of itself seems weird to me. Right. And the fact that in none of those is it commanded by God to do it. This is just like... This is how you do it, or we're going to do this together as a people for this reason, just like our in our church services, right? Like, this is mm-hmm. what we're going to do together as a corporate body right now uh, and for this purpose. And that's what you see. You see a very descriptive form of fasting all throughout the Old Testament. And that's it. Never anything proscriptive. No, do this. And I don't know what to make of that. It's just, it's... You know, here's even further than that. Not only do I not know what to make of it, it's not just Israel who fasts. It's also the city of Nineveh. After Jonah goes and preaches to Nineveh, the king and the whole people of Nineveh declare a citywide fast. Even their animals can't even eat and drink in hopes that God will relent from his promised calamity. And so yeah. I'm going, 
that's not so it's not just like a Yahweh thing. This is an ancient Near Eastern understood practice. So is it just I, I hate to put it this way, but I do I'm genuinely asking, is this just a way to manipulate God or the gods? Is this just a commonly understood way of like getting God's attention? Yeah, no, this is a great question because in the th- one of the things that was interesting to me is that in Daniel, one of the stories about fasting is not about Daniel fasting, but it's about the king fasting in hopes of Daniel not getting eaten in the lion's den. Yeah, so it, right. It's again, it's the same thing. It's a secular audience fasting in large part because they don't know what else to do, trying to get God's attention. And I think this is a piece of, when I read all of these, there is a sense of, I'm trying to get God's attention in a whole, in a special way. You know, you look at something like Isaiah 58. Again, very late. Very late. But uh, it's, in, it's all the way down to like verse 4. It says, behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours will not make your voice to be heard on high. And the thing that I think is interesting about that verse is that on some level, the implication is this kind of fasting will not make your voice heard. However, there, if you had done it right, it would have. Well, it's funny because where you stopped is actually where I picked up in my own notes. So Isaiah 58, 5 through 7, it, God actually says, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a, a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? And then is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? With God speaking here, this is the kind of fast I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. All of a sudden, we're not talking about fasting. In today's parlance, we're, we're talking about social justice. Absolutely. Well, and keep reading. Verse seven, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see them naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. On some level, the point of fasting in this particular text clearly is to create opportunity for generosity. I'm sharing. Right? Maybe because I actually read it slightly different. I read this as this is Israel's big hang up. This is the thing that Isaiah is railing against throughout the book is their lack of justice, their lack of concern for the poor. And I think rather than tying it directly to fasting, God is saying, I don't even care about your fasting until you get the first things right. And right now you are messing up big time in this area justice to the poor. Get that figured out. That's your big issue. Fasting is so secondary. That's at least how I read this. And so I don't know that fasting is automatically tied to giving of food, though it's clearly not antithetical to it. Well, but I mean, unless you're taking seven to be entirely metaphorical, it literally says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? Right. It, it, yeah, saying that right. in the context of fasting, the idea is, I would think, would be, especially because throughout Isaiah, the Jews are criticized for being affluent. And so the point does seem on some level, on a very practical level, stop taking care of yourselves and start taking care of others. And it does begin, I mean, if you're going to fast, if you're going to not eat not eat so that you can share your bread with the hungry. Yeah, I I totally see that in this text. I think I have a hard time making it a focal point of fasting because in all of the other examples that I 
have glanced at, and that admittedly it's a glance as I just kind of look through, I don't see fasting being tied to social justice. I see fasting being tied to, you know, either repentance or, you know, like a communal time of transition. Uh, and, and so this is an opportunity to seek God earnestly through fasting. And I see that motif being played out more than just this one example of social justice being tied to fasting. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying not throughout the rest of this text, but throughout the other texts, the theme of justice does not seem to play out as consistently. I am saying that. I'm also saying I I I see how you're reading this text and I think it's absolutely plausible and I I still think that there's room to see it more broadly than than you're taking it but I would have to dig in to know whether or not I even you know land there sure and we don't want to get too nailed down on the specifics of an individual text we kind of want a bird's eye view here so if we take that to at least say God's criticism of fasting in that situation was it was not accompanied by justice. Does that seem like a fair yeah, criticism? Yeah, 100%. So what else do you see in the Old Testament that makes it interesting to you? Or, or what yes. other pieces can we add to this puzzle? Well, first I want to go back. I did my little glance at the lexicon and— you are right. I don't see any references to the noun or the verb form of fast in the Pentateuch. Uh, so the, the verb form is tsom, or tsum, and the noun is tsom, and I don't see either of those in the Pentateuch. However, there are a couple references in uh, First and Second Samuel, and there are, I think there's one in Judges. So I, I know there's a lot of debate about, you know, dating various uh, things, but I do, I think that at least pushes it up earlier in Israel's history uh, quite a bit. So let's so, take, so what's the judge's reference? Because that would, in theory, that would be our earliest reference in Israel's history. That's their starting point. How is fasting a part of society and to what degree, even before the monarchy? Okay, so I don't have my English Bible in front of me. So if you want to turn to Judges twenty twenty six, that is the reference that I see in the lexicon. Okay. Uh, and it I should be here. for the verb form. Okay, it says, All the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was, was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministered before them in those days, saying, Shall we go out once more to battle before, against our brothers, the people of Benjamin, or shall we cease? And the Lord said, Go up for tomorrow, I will give them into your hand. So this is very much in keeping with, if I were to summarize what seem to me to be the big themes of the Old Testament as I scan through the verses where I could find the word fasting in English, it basically was weeping, fasting, sackcloth, ashes, and mourning, and mm -hmm. or trying to get God's attention in a very specific way. Yes. Yes, that's how I read it. Yes. Desperation is the word that comes to mind in both categories. I am desperately yes. concerned about how badly I am I have screwed this up or I am desperately in need of you cuz things are not good. Yes. And that is exactly what I was struck by as I started looking at this, because I feel like that intensity, that sense of corporate, oh, shoot, right? Like, I just feel like there's a whole societal level of, oh, man, 
we got to get our act together and we need God right now. I see that being played out in these texts. And I don't, this is not overly judgmental. I'm really genuinely curious. I don't always see that same thing reflected in our modern application of fasting. I feel like fasting lacks the punch that I see in these texts, that desperation that you're talking about. And I kind of feel like maybe fasting is bland and maybe a little bit unhelpful without it. Yeah, I, I, I think there are two kinds of situations I've seen fasting done in corporate situations. Obviously, when it's private, we will not have seen it. And so we have, you know, can I just say from a, a discipleship pedagogy standpoint, telling us that we need to do certain habits in private certainly makes it hard to learn from one another. Um, <laughs> I just... Right. Pedagogically, me and Jesus need to have words about this because, boy, talk about having to reinvent the wheel every single generation. But anyway, um, I, I'm sure he's right, by the way. I, I just— well, I, I, But know. I don't know if that's the point of the text. I mean, yes, he tells us to go and pray in, in quiet and all of these things, but and, and to not like give away the fact that we're fasting. But I, I still think the corporate fast is the predominant application— And so Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's like just 100% supposed to be a private thing. No, I agree. And when you talk about desperation, the one time in modern life that I have seen fasting done that way, uh, a while back, some financial stuff happened at our church, and it looked like we were going to lose our building that we were doing church in. And... One of the pastor's initial responses was to call the leadership to a time of fasting and praying. And that had that sense of desperation. God, you got to do something because if you don't do something, we have no plan here. But I think other than that, so often our fasting is, well, tis the season, right? Um, (laughs) You can't. It is a weird thing to just randomly be desperate for 40 days before Easter every year. Those two things seem to be in contrast to one another, right? Rhythmic sure. regularity and desperation. Yeah. You know, it's funny because you mentioned the 40 days. So my brain kind of did a leap And I thought about Jesus fasting in the desert for 40 days. And I thought about your comment just a moment ago about how things done in private don't help us learn very much. We have no idea how desperate Jesus felt during his fast. I mean, I guess we get some inkling of it that by the end of it, he was pretty wiped out. But we, we only come in at the end. We don't know what those 40 days were like. And Jesus is on the cusp of his public ministry. And so is this one of those desperation, Holy Father, you've got to be with me sorts of things? But the, like the, test, the text doesn't tell us that one way or the other. So again, it's, it's done in private. I don't know how to learn from it. Absolutely. Well, and I wonder, you know, I told you my starting point was Jesus says this is going to be different in the future than it was in the past. That is his stance on on fasting, right? With the whole wineskin thing, don't use new wine for old wineskins or old wine for new wineskins or, you know, just, I mean, at this point, we've moved beyond wineskins for our wine anyway, which is great, I'm sure. But, <laughs> um, you know, use the right wineskins. Um, if, if that is my starting point, And I think about the way we have historically fasted, at least in the modern era, because I am not aware of the church history trends on fasting. I am aware of the early church fathers who went out into the desert and became desert monks 
and fasted to such a significant degree that they like hallucinated and became crazy people, uh, which does not nearly express the amount of respect and appreciation I have for them in their writings, but nevertheless. Mm. Uh, And I am aware of the evangelical trend of fasting for Lent. Oh, and several hundred years of Catholics not having meat on Fridays. Um, right. Uh, that's that's what I know. Um, but if I look at what fasting has looked like compared to what it looked like in the Old Testament, I wonder how much a potential difference could be instead of there being moments of desperation that require fasting, fasting is could be used to evoke the desperation rather than responding to it. Yeah. And I think it's instructive, right? Because I, I have, this is my ignorance coming through, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think the context of the passage that I shared earlier about how people are accusing Jesus and his disciples of not fasting. I think the context is the celebration of Yom Kippur. And so why are they not fasting for Yom Kippur? And so they have this built-in ritual that they do annually. And so Jesus in that moment doesn't choose to disparage the annual fast itself, but instead chooses to talk about the heart condition with which people approach it. So Hmm. maybe that just means he cares more about that than the other and didn't care to bring it up. Or it could be a tacit acknowledgement that this is a justifiable practice. Well, and and even it's interesting to me, you quoted the line he says in there, when the bridegroom is not with you, you'll fast— It does not seem unusual to me to live in a world where Jesus is not physically present as king or otherwise. Hmm. I wonder to what degree fasting is a remembrance that our king is missing in action. Not that he's not on the throne in heaven, but he's not on the throne on earth. Mm. And for all the world, we need him to be. Mm. You know, I I wonder if there's an eschatological, to use fancy language, purpose behind fasting that ultimately is a prayer that the kingdom comes. Yeah, I, I... I definitely think you're onto something. I think that that is a useful way to employ fasting. And I think in large part, I don't know if this is true, but it kind of feels like we get to, we get to supply part of the answer here. Like how Mm -hmm. will I use fasting to encounter God better? Because there's this implication that we will fast No commandment that will fast, but an implication that it will continue to happen, but no direction on how or why or to what end. And so I I almost feel like we're just kind of putting some pieces together and forging a path together. I don't know what else to do. No, absolutely. I think this is exactly right. And this is, from a pastoral perspective— One of the things that happens when local churches say, hey, we're going to fast in this season together, there is always a chunk of people in the congregation that think to themselves or say, well, the Bible isn't making me do that. It's just human authority making me do that, so I don't have to participate. Hmm. And I think perhaps— Without wanting to say you have to do everything your pastor tells you to do. That's not my point. But the logic there, I only have to do what the Bible tells me to do, misses the creative space that we have as practitioners, practitioners of the kingdom, Mm. 
practitioners of the gospel, practitioners mm. of the Jesus way, to do things however we want to do them. And if our duly constituted authority in our local expression of that kingdom says, hey, we are doing it this way, I don't know that recalcitrance, because it's not in the text, is a proper or helpful response. Right. Well, I think it speaks to a heart condition behind that defiance that is uh, that needs some maturation. But then I also think, like you said, you're you're missing an opportunity here, and especially if we think about the desperation piece and the opportunity to maybe even cultivate a remembrance of the how desperate we really are for God. That seems like a valuable thing to cultivate cultivate in my life. And if not having McDonald's today helps me do that, it seems worth it. Absolutely. And and at what point could it hurt, right? Are we as reasonably affluent American Christians anywhere near the point where we are over fasting? <laughs> Fair, fair. Though I will speak to, you know, I do think that there are people with certain health conditions that should Excellent. very much consider with their doctor whether or not this is a healthy practice. So I do think there are some rare exceptions, but oh, by absolutely. and large, well, I and, completely agree. And I would broaden fasting out beyond just food, personally. I am not necessarily in the the majority on this, but, you know, going back to that Isaiah text that said, the fasting I want is justice. Clearly, God is not super fixated on whether it's food or not, if like giving to the poor is a kind of fasting. Yeah. So I, I actually found that really interesting. When I st- when I start any sort of investigation, I start with the biblical languages just because I love them. And so I looked up, as you already know, the, the both the Hebrew and the Greek words for fasting. And they very clearly mean going without food, which is not actually to contravene what you just said, because ultimately, when you go back to the Daniel fast, that's really fascinating. It lists all the things that he abstained from. You mean fascinating? Ah, (laughs) nice. Uh, I think we need to give like a, like, there was a sportscaster in uh, the Portland area when I grew up that he used to give a burnt biscuit award to like some boneheaded play that happened in sports world. And I feel like we need to have like some version of the burnt biscuit, bad dad joke award that we hand out to each other on this podcast. But um, we'll work on that. But going back to the Daniel fast, I found it really fascinating because it lists all the things that he abstained from, including food and drink, but he also abstained from lotion he didn't put oil and lotion on his body. And I thought, there you go. There's a biblical example, even beyond the Isaiah text that you referenced, of quote unquote fasting from something that is not food. So I do think it's justifiable to do that. Well, and what this means on, on a very practical level is that every teenager who does not use deodorant is doing it for biblical reasons. Okay, I am so glad that my 13-year-old does not listen to the podcast yet. (laughs) But no, I, 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 exactly. Clearly, the root of the word has to do with food. But God broadens it out. A lot of times I hear people talk about a social media fast. Is that helpful? Absolutely. Mm. Does that probably create legitimate cravings? In somebody's brain? Yes. Does it create more space for God in their life? Absolutely. Does it create an opportunity for them to depend on God instead of depending on something else? 100%. Yeah, so good. I, you know, I want to actually turn to the audience and say clearly we've not solved the theological questions around fasting. So we're looking for a community response. We would actually love to hear your experiences of fasting. I understand the biblical injunction to not be like broadcasting your fam your fasting to everyone and and flaunting it. 
but I do want to encourage us to learn from one another's experience. Even if you have a positive one or one that you think is instructive to others, I still think that's valuable. And I'd love to hear about it. How have you engaged with fasting? How has your church, your Christian community engaged in fasting? And how does it help us understand fasting on a broader level? So come join the conversation. I'm like desperate. uh, There's the word again. I'm desperate to hear from you guys because I don't feel like I'm there yet. And uh, we want this to be a group conversation. So you can join us on Facebook or on Instagram. Just search either of those for On the Phone with Josh. We can't wait to hear from you and broaden out this conversation and this concept. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait. So Josh from Missouri, thank you for a really good conversation. I want to just turn on a dime real quick and ask you, what else have you been thinking about? Oh, sure. Um, I have started reading a book you recommended to me uh, that is titled Embodied by Preston Sprinkle. Yeah! Yeah. I I am super excited about it. He clearly is seeking to be an intelligent, compassionate, biblically faithful human being thinking about very complicated issues. Is that a fair summary of his starting point? That's a beautiful summary, and I could not agree more. It's exactly why I recommended the book. And I am only in chapter two, which is his definitions chapter, which I am absolutely loving. And so many folks that I talk to, even as he is distinguishing between the meaning of the words like sex and gender, it is exceptionally helpful to clearly define one's terms and to understand what those terms actually mean uh, Mm -hmm. before ascribing any kind of theological weight to anything or making any kind of claim about what the Bible is trying to teach, let's just step back and and assess our language is such a helpful starting point because Mm -hmm. so often we don't use words precisely. And so misunderstanding comes up because Words do not have an absolute God-given definition, (laughs) right? Words have a socially constructed definition. And so when we use words, we need to make sure that the listener and the speaker are on the same page about what the word means. Otherwise, we just create confusion. Yeah, I think about a recent episode where you defined the word charity to say this is more than just like taking pity on somebody and giving them food or money. This charity has a much broader definition and you went on to define it. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important for us to just understand that words change their meaning over time and that we need to be attentive to that. And so I'm just really grateful, first of all, about where he's coming from. And second of all, the way in which he is very carefully trying to work out a coherent sense of what a reasonable follower of Jesus can think about these issues. And I'm excited to see where he, what he says, because I feel like, uh, you know, I think it was Ben Franklin or somebody like that that said, if you stand in the middle of the road, you're going to get hit by traffic on both sides. I feel like he is that guy and I love him for it. (laughs) Yeah. I think by the end, he will take pretty definitive stances, but he will do so without sounding so much like a jerk. Yeah. He's not a stick in the mud. He. Yeah, it's it's great. So I'm glad yeah. you're liking it. I'm I'm super excited about it. It's very engaging. I have had I'm listening to it and he is the narrator. So that's wonderful. It's always great when the author is the narrator and 
he, he is nuancing things enough that several times I've had to back up a little bit and re-listen, uh, which is mm. okay because it's a fairly short book, but I'm, I'm loving it. What That's about so you? Good. What have you been thinking about other than issues around fasting? Yeah. Well, I also have my thoughts coming from a book. I'm reading a book called The Flourishing Pastor by Tom Nelson. And have you read this, by, by, by the way? I have not. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think it's I think it's a good book. I I wouldn't put it in the great category, mostly because a lot of the content is stuff that you and I have engaged in before. So I don't feel like it'll be entirely new, but I appreciate uh, what he's writing and how he's writing it. But he did have this insight that I thought was particularly noteworthy, and he he referenced the fact that he got this from a a mentor of his, who said, we overestimate what we can do in a year, and we underestimate what God can do in a decade. Mm. We're just, I think both halves of that speak to our impatience. It spoke to me of my impatience. Maybe I need to say it that way. I very clearly overestimate what I can do in a year and I am running like mad to try to catch up to my own aspirations. But at the same time, I underestimate what God can do over the course of 10 years. And I think I am trying to outrun God. I am I am trying to just push God to get stuff done now. We've got to go, go, go. When in reality, God's playing the long game here. And maybe I need to join him at his speed. It makes me think of Dallas Willard's famous quote, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Mm. And I'm really, really caught by both of those things. But particularly in the lens of maybe I need to more highly value what God can do in a decade. Maybe by doing that, I will ruthlessly eliminate hurry from my life. And I will not overestimate what I can do in a year. Oh man, that's super good. That's so good. Well, shifting gears from uh, what we've been thinking about, uh, it is time for our weekly Which Josh question. And today's question is, which Josh was born without a middle name? I just wanted and to pause that, long enough there to make sure that uh, the invisible music or the the silent music that we always play. Uh, I guess I'm just <laughs> saying I think we need a theme song for this segment. <laughs> I think you're right. Maybe I should talk to the editor about that. Or, or, uh, or you know, we could just insert something. And the answer is... That sounded like a 70s game show. Uh, Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the answer is uh, me, Josh from Oregon. I was originally born without a middle name. Uh, I think if I remember my story right, this is great. Like My mom will have to listen to this episode and correct me, and I'll never mention it again on the podcast, so it won't matter. But uh, (laughs) I I think the story goes that she intended – for me to have a middle name. And somehow in the writing down of all the things in the hospital, it just never happened. And so I was originally born without a middle name. But a couple of years later, she got married and her husband adopted me. And that's how I have my current last name. And when they redid uh, all the paperwork, I was given the middle name I should have always had anyway. So, and for all of you going, well, what is it? Uh, Cephas. No, I'm kidding. I, I like to tell people that, but it's a uh, uh, Craig, Craig, there you go. Well, congr- congratulations, Craig. That is a great story. I appreciate <laughs> you telling it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. There it is. All right. Well, are we on for next week? I can't wait. I will talk to you then. All right. Talk to you then. Bye. Bye. What?